And so we're monochrome for some strange reason. I'm actually using a webcam to look at a monitor. Um, and so because it's a webcam, it thinks we're having a video chat, so everything's left, right, flopped. Ignore the fact that it's grayscale and left, right, flopped, and that the audio is crap, because that's all a consequence of the way things are connected here in this room. Normally, you see video at a rate comparable to VHSs. So let's set the Wayback Machine, Sherman, shall we? And there we go. I'm going to shut down the uh, video. Here we go. OK, very good. <clears throat> so as, uh, as Bill mentioned, I'm going to be talking about the evolution of the Commodore Full Motion Video, uh, the FMV card family. It really is a family. The only one you guys have probably ever even heard about is the one that goes in the CD32. that has a broken magnetic little snap on it, anyway, that lives in the back here as a separate card. This is the one that went to production. So first off, here's our agenda. We're going to talk about who was these people that did this thing, what the standards were that we worked to, um, what a generic full motion video kept, or, uh, uh, playback architecture would look like in an Amiga. And uh, finally, a project by project breakdown of the full motion video card designs and their supporting interfaces. So Jeff Porter was our director. Um, he went to Scala after, after Commodore and is pretty widely known as the uh, VP over there. Uh, Headley Davis was our chief engineer and also our manager. He um, might be known to some of you from the Headley High Res Monitor um, and several other things he did. Uh, there was a fellow named Scott Schaefer who was there before me, and then I arrived, and then later on a guy named Chris Coley moved over from the PC group. Anybody remember the Commodore Colt? He was one of the he was one of the guys that was the engineer on the Colt. So. Between uh, when I got there in 91 and 94 when uh, it pretty much cratered, uh, we did several different projects, and I'd like to play a little game with you. So, hands up, anybody in the room that knows what a CDTV CR is? Oh, we got one. Okay, some people might remember seeing one of these things at Amy West a couple of years ago that was dropped off by, uh, what was it, Carl Sassenrath, right? And um, this box was going to be a replacement for the CDTV Classic, as we were calling it the one that uh, Don Gilbreth's group did in the special projects group. Um, it got through pilot production. We built, I think, 64 of them in pilot in addition to the previous um, lab-based prototypes. And because there were still plenty of existing CDTVs in the warehouse, we weren't allowed to go on to full production with them. But they were ready to go. They were a rock-solid machine. It would have sold for the same thing that a CDTV does, but it would have cost Commodore something like 30% less to produce. So it would have been a profit generating machine for the company and perhaps helped with holding things off, holding the end off a little while longer. But it wasn't to be. So um, Headley Davis, again, chief engineer for the group. He was the chief engineer on this project. He and both Scott Schaefer and myself worked on the board for it. Um, and then um, the Grace chip, which is the Bridge chip, the G's, so G's and B's, right? OK. Does everybody know what the G's and the B chips are on the motherboards for the Amiga products? Things like Gale Budgie, um, Gary Buster. They're the bridge chips that put the, uh, the processor bus and the chip side bus together. So traffic coming from the processor gets through the G and B chips to get to Paulus, Agna, Denise, the chip RAM, all that kind of thing. It goes through the G and B chips. Um, they're basically the traffic cops. In modern technology, they would be called North Bridges. Um, the G chip was the address and control. The B chip was the data path. How about this one? MPEG 4000. MPEG 4000. OK. Proof of concept. It was my design. Uh, Chris Coley was pretty instrumental in it as well. 
We'll talk about all of these things later, but I just wanted to see where we, where we, where we benchmarked at this point. The next one you might have heard of, CD32. Anybody heard of a CD32? Lots of hands, lots of hands. Oh, yeah, one of these. <laughs> Another thing that our group did in that same 1993 time frame, I have to say that the uh, MPEG-4000 was the beginning of 93. The CD32 was the end of 93. It was designed to be released in holiday, you know, Christmas kind of time frame for the 32-bit the um, game machine. The world's first 32-bit game machine, CD32. At the same time, I, there wasn't a delay. These were available on the same day that these were available. Apparently, they were much more available in Europe than the US. Mine says on the back of it, Funkenstortnach, DBG, VFG, 1046 slash 84, whatever that means. You got me. Um, who's ever heard of the CD1200? Mm, yeah, there's a couple of references that on the web, not very many. And that was in 94. 94 was a momentous year for Westchester. If you remember, that's the year that things came crashing down in April. So there wasn't a whole lot of 94 before uh, we got to that point. So this was a, an early prototype stage. And we had plans, we had concepts for where to take this beyond. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what that was all about. So let's jump into what the standards are that we were working to. So some of the basic CD standards, they, they come in books. The books have colored covers. The white book, the red book, the green book, the yellow. The red book was the first one. It actually described an audio CD, you know, round, flat, shiny, five inches, very different from round, black, grooved, 12 inches that mechanical things rubbed across. These were, these were based on, uh, on actual uh, reflections of laser light and canceling out or doubling up, depending on the depth of the pit, using, um, def uh, using a uh, um, superposition so that things would either, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for, where they, they cancel or they, when they're in, when they're in phase, they, they double, when they're out of phase, they cancel, right? Reinforce, Reinforce right, okay, yeah, so at, at um, where the pit wasn't, it, the, waves, the wavelengths were set so that they would reinforce. The pits are actually a half wavelength deep, so that they were quarter wavelength deep, so that when they reflect back, it was a half wavelength out of phase, and you would get a, you would get a cancellation. So you're getting ones and zeros by looking at the reflected laser light and having it be either reinforced or canceled out. So it was released in 1980. The data rate at that point was 1.5 megabits per second, which is absolutely screaming in those days. You might have heard of you know, 1x CDs. When you hear of a 2x CD, it's running at 3 megabits per second. A 4x, 6, 8x, 12. You know. So it's, that's your baseband is 1.5 megabits per second data rate. 1.5 is actually kind of an approximation, because really what you're doing is you're doing audio in left and right channels with 16 bits per channel at 44.1 kilohertz kilosamples per, per second. So if you do that multiplication, you end up with 1,411, 200 bits per second that you have to transfer. There's some other little bits in there that aren't quite Yeah, yeah, and there's a little overhead, right. That's, that's your, but your actual over, yeah, but when you subtract the overhead off that's there to make sure that your quality is good, you're still subtracting the overhead off. So the data rate of the actual data that you're passing is just a schmidge under 1.5. Yeah. Well, it actually says that's like where they stick graphics on these things, like G format. Yeah, and, and, and they, and they there's, there's information on there like which frame, uh, you know, which, which, which sec, minute, second, and frame goes along with it, timing information, SMPTE -E code, that kind of stuff. But it's, it's the overhead. Um, the standard one carried 74 minutes. Okay, you multiply 1.5 megabits per second times 74 minutes, and that's how many megabytes or gigabytes or whatever that was able to be stored on one of these things. Um, a, a while later, they came out with an 80-minute, because 74 is a sort of a funny number, uh, the extended version of it. Anybody know why 74 minutes was chosen as a minimum requirement for an audio CD in 1980? Believe it or not. The, uh, the Philips, Philips and Sony were the two developers of this, and the CEO of Sony was a classical music fan, and he liked a particular recording of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony that lasted 74 minutes, and be damned if we were going to ever see something that could not contain an entire 
uh, performance of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony on one disc that needed you to stop and change in the middle. So it was a 74 minute. Long, long while later, 1993, out comes the white, white book standard, which is for video CD. Um, Jeff Porter, who was the director of the uh, multimedia projects group at Compact, or Commodore, was one of the people who was involved in contributing to that spec. So Commodore had an involvement in video CD from the beginning. Before it was ever a product, while it was still in conceptual phase, Commodore was involved. So what is this video CD? It uses the same standard data format to store the data that a, a data CD does. Um, in between the white book and the earlier red book, there were, I think the yellow book was the one for data CD, and it's ISO 9660 is the standard for that. Um, again, 74 minutes is the usual maximum length. They could go to 80 with the extended format. Um, there were two formats, one for audio, one for video. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about them in detail when we get into the next set of standards. Uh, the, 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 the one that you might have heard of that's not right in here, this is uh, MPEG-1 Part 3 Audio Layer 2. There was another one, MPEG-1 Part 3 Audio Layer 3, that people were, um, abbreviated to MP3. So this is very much related to MP3, only it's MP2. And really the only place that MP2 got used was on uh, the MPEG audio standard, um, whether video CD or any other method of storing MPEG audio. Um, again, stereo channel, 44.1 kilohertz sampling rate. And if you multiplied out the earlier, we saw it was 1.4 and change megabits per second to give you the raw audio. This is compressed. In the MPEG format, you're only going to get 224 kilobits per second of audio to generate out that same audio. So they've done some compression algorithms to, to allow you to get more or less the same level of quality that you do off the raw audio from a compressed bitstream. So now we talk about video. Um, again, it's using an MPEG-1 part 2. Uh, we'll talk about MPEG more in a little bit. Using an H.262 decoder. Um, for the VCD. Uh, for MPEG-2, it's the Super VCD Part 2, and the differences are what resolutions. In the US, we used VCD uh, at 352 by 240. In Europe, it was 352 by 288. PAL gives you a couple more lines at the bottom. Um, Super VCD came later, but it was a 480 by 480 square or a 480 by 576 in PAL. And the frame rate was basically 30 hertz. So it's the same kind of frame rate you expect to see in most computers. Um, and in 25 hertz for PAL, same as you'd see there. And the bit rates, well, OK, so you had 1.5 megabits to start with. You subtract it off the 224. You're left with about 1.13 megabits per second for your video stream. Yep. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's all kinds of crazy stuff they do to make sure that what you're getting delivered is, is what you put in. Um, error detection, error correction, that kind of thing. Did you have a question? Yes, Beth. Uh, well, this is dealing with audio CDs. What is the super audio CD that like, Sony kind of promoted? Here? Yeah, it was basically using um, MPEG-2 instead of MPEG-1 um, audio formats. Um, we're not really going to talk about them, but if you want to know more about them, yeah, you can start looking at what MPEG-2 audio formats look like and get to SACD from there. All right. so. Uh, the MPEG standard itself, the MPEG-1 standard had multiple parts. The first three are the ones that really concerned us. In the hardware development situation, that was the system part in part one, the audio part in part, or sorry, video part in part two, and the audio part in part three. So you'll, you know, if you look back at uh, this one here, we talked about MPEG-1 part three, audio layer two, right? Okay, MPEG-1 part three. That's where that name comes from. And in the video standard, it was MPEG-1 part two, da 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 da. That's where that name came from, is which of the different parts of the primary MPEG-1 spec that, that it came from. Um, so the goal was to have VHS quality video together with CD quality audio and to put that whole thing into a 1.5 megabit per second data stream. That was the goal. And uh, that standard was released in 93. The encoding and decoding are asymmetric, by which I mean that the process used to create an MPEG stream um, and the process used to decode the MPEG stream 
are, are not connected to each other. Um, the process to encode a MPEG stream, um, OK, so I'll go to the next line. Image quality is very dependent on the encoding process. So if you were in a big old hurry, you could take a movie and slice it up into frames and convert all of those frames into an MPEG data uh, video stream, which we'll talk about in the next slide a little bit more. And whatever the computer gave you is what the computer gave you. Now, when you decoded that same thing, you, the image that you got is the image that you got. On the other hand, if you were more careful about that and you did a second pass and found where there were errors and cleaned them up and maybe even had to tweak things by hand, it looked beautiful. It really did. It looked way better than VHS quality. That took a lot of manual intervention, a lot of CPU time, and so um, we'll see how that affected the market here when I get to talking about uh, CD32s. So more on the MPEG-1 standard. The audio section is, OK, here, yeah, MPEG-3, part, uh, MPEG-1, part 3, audio layer 2, also known as MP2, right? OK, we talked about that. What they're doing is they're taking a time domain, converting it to a frequency domain, using a 1,000-point FFT, and they're breaking that up into 32 bands. Basically, what that means is, instead of keeping track of the voltage of an audio waveform and how high or how low it is, instead they're saying, let's keep track of the frequencies that we're hearing, just like our ears actually do. We don't sense pressure waves coming and going. We sense high pitches and low pitches. And there's a whole reason that the cochlea is curved and all that that makes that happen. Um, so this is kind of replicating what human hearing is sensitive to. And if there's really high energy in certain frequency bands and really low energy in certain other frequency bands, you're really not going to notice the low energy frequency bands. Hey, Trevor. And so the MP3 standard, or the MPEG, uh, MPEG audio standard, has some thresholding that it does dynamically to determine when it feels that those low energy areas are insignificant, and it drops them entirely. And so if it drops them, it doesn't need to transmit them. If it doesn't need to transmit them, it's using less bandwidth. That's part of how they get from the audio CD uncompressed 1.5 megabits down to just 224 kilobits for the MPEG audio. So video. So you got a screen. It's full of video. That's a lot of bits, especially with color depths of like 12-bit color like the Amiga has. That's a, lot of, that's a lot of information. That's hard to stream by. Um, so what it's doing is it's working on little blocks, 16 by 16. And sometimes you'll see that if you're watching a movie or something and there's a little bit of a glitch, you'll see these squares all over the place. Those are the macro blocks. Um, I got a little note here, 422. What that means is that um, they're not processing them in exactly pixels, per se. They're processing them by saying that your eye is more sensitive to intensity. So we're going to allocate um, four well, okay, we're going to get all 16 by 16 uh, pixels in that macro block. We're going to have an intensity level. But you're less sensitive to color. And so they break color up into a sort of a, an IQ. A, 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 you know, it, it, you're talking about a surface. If you did like an RGB triangle, somewhere on that surface is where you are in RGB. And then the intensity moves you up and down. So by describing it as like sort of an XY coordinate, which they call CRCY, I think it is, then you can describe where in that space you are in your color. But because you're less sensitive to color, they only give you half as many pixels. So for every four pixels of intensity, you're only getting two pixels of color and two pixels of color. So it's really not exactly 16 by 16. I mean, it is 16 by 16 when it hits the screen, but the data that you have to transport is really only more like 8 by 8 because you're only transmitting half of your color information. Um, if you really are interested, you can just put in 422 like that with the colons between into Wikipedia. It gives you a really great little explanation of how 422 video works. Um, the other thing it does is motion vector and macro black transformations. So motion vector is I'm here, and in the next frame, I'm here. OK, so it saw my eye. That might fit in 16 by 16 pixels. And then over here, it said, hey, wait, these 16 by 16 pixels in this frame matched those 16 by 16 pixels in the other frame. So instead of having to transmit all 16 by 16, I'll just say, remember that one? Move it here. And so there's 
motion vectors is what they call that when they, they match up um, new macro blocks to old macro blocks and then just have to transmit where the macro blocks moved to rather than retransmit all the bits in it. Unfortunately, sometimes things aren't exactly perfect. So what they'll do is they'll say, you know, here's, here's these pixels. Notice I'm leaning this way a little bit. Here's the same pixels. Notice I'm leaning this way a little bit. But because things shifted, you're going to have to transform a few of the pixels here and there. So again, instead of sending the whole block, they're sending the, it moved to here, and here's the little changes that you have to make. So it's really much more efficient than sending every pixel in the entire image, rasterizing it out, and, and sending the whole thing. So <clears throat> you've all seen a JPEG image. In a JPEG image, they do some image compression, but you're really getting the entire image in it. Okay. So the, the MPEG specification talks about iframes. And what an iframe is is basically a JPEG image. You've got the entire thing. It's all there. It's, every pixel is described. And so you could make an MPEG stream. It's legal to make an MPEG stream that's iframe, 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 iframe. So you'd basically like getting a film version with every frame having everything on it. It's costly. You don't want to really do that. So then they came up with this concept of predicted frames, which is where you start getting to the motion vectors and the transforms. You say, all right, here's my reference frame right here. This is it. And then Beth moved over here. So the new frame references the old frame, but it predicts forward. It's only going forward in time where the, where the changes are from that iframe. And so that's updating the macro blocks from the previous iframe. If you have an iframe to a P frame and then another P frame later, that can also update from the previous P frame. So the preframes, P frames are always moving forward. I, P, P, P. Okay, enough changes have happened now that it doesn't make sense to start to, to keep track of all those changes. Let's send another I. And so what's happening is, is that you'll see the I's, the blue ones, are interspersed in there because there's been too many changes. Maybe there's a screen cut. Maybe, you know, like a, 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 a cut from this angle to a cut to that angle. There's almost nothing in, in common between this picture and that picture. So to try to make transforms and macro block motion vector detection and all that, it just gives up and says, tell you what, I'll just, just say that. I'll just send you all of that. And so that's why it gives you the iframes. Um, but then there's even more fine information. And you can introduce the fact that I was here, 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 and here before getting there to that P frame. So why don't I say, well, OK, I'm 10% of the way, or 90% of the way, or 20% of the way, or 80% of the way. Notice I'm moving from both directions at the same time. So you can kind of like scale back and forth. That's called bidirectional frames. And those are trying to send across absolutely the minimal amount of information they can to make the changes in the P frame or maybe the I frame that's bounding them on either side that lets it know what to do. So that's how it's getting all that huge amount of data in all those frames that are coming out bang, 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 bang into small amounts of data that say, here's what's changed. Here's what's changed. Here's what's changed. Ah, too much has changed. Let me start you over again. So that's what's going on with the MPEG video standard. Now, let's start talking about some architecture. In 1993, we had, we had Amiga 3000s. We had Amiga 2000s, 1000s, 500s. We had development going on for the Dave Haney Amiga 3500 that was just about that time being converted over into the 4000. We had the, uh, the Amiga 600, which was going to be called that because it was supposed to cost $600. And when it couldn't get to that price range, they said, well, maybe we should call it the 1200. So <laughs> yeah. Or no, sorry, it was, the it was the 300, and it became the 600. Right, it was the 300, it became the 600. The, yeah, the original 600. Apparently, if you look at some early versions of the uh, Amiga 300 or Amiga 600 motherboard, it still said A300 on it. You know, yeah, that's why it was. It was intended to be a sale product at $300. Couldn't make the price range, so they said, "All right, we'll call it a 600," which is the price they did end up selling it for 600 USD. Um, and the 1200 was also in development. So these machines were in development and not yet really out there. 
But take a look at that. 60,020s, I think maybe 30s would be about the best you've got. They were running at 14 or 28 megahertz kind of numbers. That's a lot of work for software to do. x86 machines in 2013, plenty of processing power, lots of media help in the, in the chipsets. Um, they do it in software. They don't need extra hardware that's outside of the processor to do it. But in 93, no way could the processor handle this job. Uh, we saw Brian's presentation earlier today where he was showing us some MPEG video that was being handled by software on the processor. Rock on. And that's not an easy thing to do. You know, I was, I was very impressed by that, actually. <laughs> and um, the, the, the tools that were out there at the time were video decoders from uh, C-Cube and audio decoders from LSI Logic. And um, in 93, you could get a CL450 to do uh, MPEG video decoding from C-Cube. You could get an L64111QC <laughs> from LSI Logic to do the audio encoding. And if you remember that MPEG spec, there were three parts, video, audio, and system. So guess who was responsible for system? That would be me. <laughs> so we had additional logic required to do support these MPEG decoder chips that included things like synchronizing the audio and the video together, as well as on initialization, taking their programs. They're generally like dedicated microprocessors of, the, of their own that had programs that you had to take from ROM and load them into these things at time zero when things just came back out from reset. Um, so that was part of what it did. Yeah, I mean, it's plugged into a Zorro bus, so it had to do the interface to the Zorro bus. Um, the really cool thing, though, was C-Cubed had a roadmap that in 1995 was going to come out with a, a unit called the CL480, which had your audio and your video and your system stuff Obviously, it didn't know about Zorro, but it knew about how to load its own ROMs into its, its internal RAMs to get its own programs started and all that stuff. It would have cut the system logic down to zip. All we would have had to do is basically do the, the Zorro interface. And it would have um, taken two large chips and merged them into one chip that was about the same size as the two of them. So we really had some ideas in the roadmap for where to go with the CL480 when it came out. So. Here is the block diagram of what's going on in there. So the blue blocks at the top are an Amiga. You've got your 68,000 processor. Um, you've got your Gary Buster, Grace Beauty, Gale Budgie, or Akiko, depending which generation you're in, chips that bridged over to the chip domain. Um, your Amiga chips, either OCS, ECS, AGA, AAA, whatever, over on the other side, and some kind of storage um, also going through the, the GB chips, the bridge chips. Um, <clears throat> down on the bottom is your full motion video card. So you've got a Zorro bus interface that's going to talk through the GB chips to the processor and the storage. Um, that's controlled by the control logic on the bottom that's kind of cutting across the whole card. Um, the control logic talks to the audio decode and the video decode chips. They then produce audio and video, which are run through digital to analog converters, DACs, and those Analog signals are then filtered to get them to the proper levels and the proper frequency bands and that sort of thing. And they're passed back out to the Amiga chips, which then handle things like driving the video out to your monitor and driving your audio out to your speakers. And effectively, it's kind of like a gen lock. It's like, hey, this part of the frame is supposed to belong to the full motion video card. OK, we'll take it from that. This part of the frame is some of the border. All right, we'll take it from frame buffer memory on the Amiga side of things. So the very first project that had any inkling that this stuff was coming down the line was as we were developing the CDT VCR, Jeff Porter was being involved in the development of the MPEG CD spec, or the video CD spec. So one of the things that this machine has on it that the original CDTV did not was that the graphics interface was on a separate card. One version was for PAL. One version was for NTSC. And it's being a little bit persnickety. Just give me a sec. There we go. Almost. Man, it popped right out when I did this earlier. 
There we go. I feel it moving. <laughs> I feel it moving. There we go. So this card has on it basically the video DAX that would connect to Alice, Paul, and Denise. They're basically the yellow, black, and red arrows on the edge of the Amiga chips. This is the stuff that actually gets it out to the monitor, and uh, the audio has gone a different path because it's going to talk to the processor or to the uh, the CD audio. Um, it's got analog filters. It's got its own clock source. It's got uh, triple video DAC, one for red, one for green, for one for blue. But look at this. This little connector here has a whole other door on the top of it in the back of the casework that another card could have been plugged in here. And the idea was is that there was gen locking information on this little guy here. So sure, yeah, you could put a gen lock on here and maybe take some external audio or video source and, and map it in. But what the hey, we've got a lot of signals here. Let's take that CD stream, drive it up to a card that could maybe be an MPEG decoder and have it be the source of the gen lock to go on it. And it would have taken some funny little cabling on the back and a little weirdness, but the thought was there. The thought was, if this machine ever goes to production, we've given it an expansion capability that would allow us to do things like gen locks or MPEG or who knows. It was still early enough on in concept that there was lots of flexibility, and we tried to put as much of that flexibility into that connector as we could. So even though there wasn't any kind of actual product or more than just a couple of concepts kicked around, the first inkling of doing a full motion video concept for an Amiga came in 1992 with the CD-TV-CR. Um, again, the history of this thing is that it was a cost-reduced version of the existing CD-TV. It had a drawer instead of a caddy. We built 64 units. Intended production was holiday release of 92. It was put on hold because of the existing CD TVs in the, mar in the uh, warehouse hadn't gotten out to market. Um, again, separate PAL or NTSC, different video card, but they all had the auxiliary video card connector on it. And again, this would have sourced an MPEG AV stream that could have been gen locked across your existing Amiga Video. Trevor? This was going to be the next generation. The existing CDTVs were basically an A500 motherboard with a lot of daughter cards on it. It was intended to be a proof of concept, and the CEO liked it so much that he said, let's go to production. And Don Gilbreth, who was head of that group, said, You're, no, this is a proof of concept. We need to actually make it productized. And he said, we don't have time. Let's go. So that was kind of where the original CDTV came out from. This was where Don Gilbreth wanted to go. This was the, OK, so we've done the proof of concept. We know it can be done. We know this is what the box looks like. We know what the user experience is for that box. How do we take that and make it into something that's actually production ready, that's going to give us a good return on our investment? Um, things that this guy has that the other one didn't is a built-in uh, floppy drive. There's no way to see it under here, but there's a built-in IDE hard drive inside of this. Uh, it had. The, the uh, keyboard and mouse connector on the front, this was actually both keyboard and mouse, and there was a little splitter cable, so you could run either one, or you could just plug in a keyboard, or you could just plug in a mouse. Um, it had serial on the back. It had serial on the back. It had parallel and floppy disk and RGB video. You know, this is getting to sound an awful lot like a regular Amiga, isn't it? <laughs> Left and right audio. Here's, here's, here's something that the regular Amigas didn't have. MIDI out and in directly there without having to use up a serial port and a little adapter. So this thing was really going to be quite the cool little machine. And unfortunately, it never was able to hit the market. So many things at Commodore were cool machines that yeah, yeah, they're right in that box. <laughs> All right, so now it's time to actually put the hardware together. And um, there was a thing called an MPEG 4000 Zorro 3 card. It plugged into an M it plugged into a 4000 in that slot that had the audio or the uh, AV connectors on the same plane as the Zorro connectors. Um, it was actually demoed 
at the CES in January of 93 and then CBIT in March of 93. I think the January CES was a closed door demo and the, and the CBIT one was an on the floor demo. Um, the media sources at the time, the standards were still really not all the way out for video CD, but MPEG-1 was solid. So it was an MPEG-1 file that lived on your hard drive that you would then be able to read and DMA into the, into the card and it would decode it. And it, yeah, like I said, it used the Zorro 3 video option plug-in card format. And so there's one big Zorro connector and then these two pairs together were your audio video connectors. Um, one, there was ever only one of these built. Its whereabouts is so far gone, I have no idea. Couldn't get, a, I've never seen a picture of it. Um, I would recognize it instantly because I made an error on, this, on which side of the board had the even numbered pins and which had the odds, so we had this goofy jumper system. Hey, you know, I was like, you know, three or four years into my career at the time, young, young engineer. These are the kind of errors young engineers make, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, early on in my career, I learned, I learned a lesson about, you know, double check your documentation. <laughs> so, but yeah, you'd recognize this card instantly because of the, 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 the funny jumpers that we had to put on the bottom using ribbon cable and all that. But it worked great. Um, C-Cube had put together a music video of, uh, it's from the Young Guns movie with uh, Bon Jovi's soundtrack, and they had done a fabulous job of encoding, and this thing looked awesome, and we were running on an Amiga 4000 with this plug-in card at these demos. See, it's reality. We can take a 68,000 base machine and play back full motion video at real time on it. And this is the one you know, CD32. World's first 32-bit game machine. That was our big marketing title about it. And you know, some people think, oh, it's a game machine. Well, it really is an Amiga. If you look inside, it's got the full Agnes Pauline, well, no, it's the next generation, so what, Alice, Lisa, the full chipset, 68020, I think, is what it came with. Um, it had a serial port. Where do we put it? Yeah, it was labeled AUX. What it was is it was the keyboard port from the A4000, the small round one. It's the small one, right? Yeah. But it also used two of the extra pins to do a TX and RX serial port on it. So you could break it out and have a serial port for debugging and for anything else. The modem, right? Okay, this was back in the day when Ethernet cards weren't all that common, but dial ups were still real common. So the concept was is you could do multiplayer games over the phone dial-up networks, and that wouldn't that be cool? But then, um, you know, in the back it had your 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 standard kind of video outputs, S video and red, green, uh, red, white, and yellow for your component video, composite video, and your your stereo audio. It even still was doing an RF modulator to be on channel three or channel four for your television. And it, uh, you know, power. And as we saw earlier, when we were playing a audio or a video CD, this is an actual video CD compliant with the video CD standard. Um, it's got an extra track on it because Philips and Sony, um, Philips was producing the CDI player that was available in um, '93 at Christmas, which is when we were trying to get this guy out. And Philips had uh, worked with. Paramount as a studio to release 50, because what's the point of having a player if you don't have any content for it? 50 movies from the Paramount library were converted to video CD in less than six weeks to be put out on the market to go along with both the CDI player and ours. And, you know, Philips didn't care that we could play them too. In fact, they were a little bit annoyed, but um, they needed something for their, their CDI player. Again, Philips was one of the, the major drivers in the, in the CD, in all of the audio media standards. So they really wanted to be first. That we were there barking on their heels was not very happy for them. But that six week turnaround to do 50 movies, they just slammed them through the encoding. Just get them through, get them through as quick as they can. The result was is that there were a lot of macro blocks because if you do that IBP kind of encoding and you see, one of the things that you can do is you can encode it. Then you play it back. 
Then you look for the errors. Where did we get it wrong? How can we go back and fix the encoding to reduce those errors and reduce the errors and reduce the errors? Is a multi-pass encoding process is absolutely possible with MPEG-1 and even MPEG-2. But they didn't do that. It was just like one pass, get it out. We need content. We need content on the same day that we launch our players. So the result was everybody went home and said, oh, this is so cool. Instead of a big fat VHS and thing, I got the little round shiny thing. I'm going to put it in here and look at this. Oh, look, this is looking like crap. <laughs> you know, why did I buy this? Had they taken the time to really do good quality, I think it would have pushed off the requirement to have DVDs another year or two because these could have been in the market, which would have, you know, maybe given Compaq or Commodore. Okay, I have to admit, I left Commodore, I went to Compaq. I'm going to say Compaq a couple of times when I meant Commodore. It's just my history. Sorry about that. Anyway, it would have perhaps given Commodore an income stream that would have kept him along long enough to maybe get into the DVD market when that time came from. Didn't happen. Um, so people have heard about the Akiko chip. What the Akiko chip is, is it's a collection of a bunch of the chips that were on the board, plus a little extra logic that was required for this project. It had the G and the B chips. The specific ones that we used were the Grace and the Beauty. This one's Grace in the, C in the CD30, uh, CDTVCR, and this one's Beauty from the CDTVCR. So these are the CDTVCR chips that are migrated to this platform together with the 6520 complex interface adapters, the, the famous ports and timers that are when your machine blows up, it's probably that. <laughs> Because the guy that, that worked on this said to me one day, as he ported the, the C, uh, CIAs over into ASIC logic from full custom logic, hey, do these things ever blow up? I said, yeah, why? He says, because they didn't put any ESD protection, any electrostatic discharge protection on any of the IOs. And it's like, uh, zap, OK, that's the end of your 6520. If the, no, there was none. So that's why on, I think it's the 1000s, you'll see ferrite beads along the, along the connectors is to try to keep down on the, on the possibility of zapping those, zapping those um, complex interface adapters. So those were pulled in. We added the CD driver logic that you, know, you needed it to talk to these CDs. These CDs, very similar um, mechanics and electronics in this one as to this one that's open and I can show you. Uh, this was a time when there was not such a thing as an IDE CD drive that you could buy off the shelf and plug in. <coughs> These were being basically developed in parallel with that development that other people were doing. But Commodore wasn't interested in those anyway because we were getting these at half the price because we had to do our own controller. So there's logic in a Kiko that's doing things like driving the focus electronics on the, the, the sled that's driving the positioning of the sled and finding the, the error, everything that needed to be done to make a CD happen in the controller domain was being done on a Kiko. It was being done in Grace on this one. And um, the other thing that we added, got a lot of press, was the chunky to planar graphics converter. Uh, at the time, PC games were starting to come up a little bit. They organized things differently. Here's a pixel. It's got red, green, and blue parts. Amiga said, here's all the red pixels, here's all the green pixels, here's all the blue pixels. So we were planar, we called it, and they were chunky. And so if you had a software developer that wrote a title that wanted to port from their PC graphics that was chunky oriented to something that was planar oriented, this was a very fast little circuit that let you take your graphics and convert them from basically PC graphics to the planar graphics that the Amiga chipset used. All it really was was a register array that you wrote in this way and you read out that way. It was really fast. But it got a lot of press. I don't know why. It was uh, three of us sitting around a picnic table having Subway sandwiches going, wouldn't it be cool if? <laughs> <laughs> so here's the CD32 motherboard. And uh, eh, not real clear. But here, up in here, this is really what I wanted to show off. That's a full implementation of a Zorro bus and the audio and video buses just like you find on that one slot that's got them all together on your Zorro 3 um, uh, motherboard or uh, daughterboard plane on your 4000. Same thing right here. These are all the same signals. So it's all there. And if that's all there, if the Zorro is all there, what can you do with that? Well, okay, you've got your Zorro and your AV, you could do this, but 
if you go in the back there, there's a, a, a box plugged into the club's CD32 that has a hard drive in it. It's got the 23-pin graphics adapter in it. It's got serial port on it. It's got everything. So the concept was you buy this. Your kids can play games based on CDs. You want to buy them a computer, too? Don't bother. Just plug something onto the back of it that gives them everything that an Amiga is. And it's really just the ports, because the rest of it's already right here. It's not a games player only. No, that was the that was the break that was the break into the market and then expand on it from there was the whole concept. We weren't the only ones. Coleco had a similar sort of system, but theirs was instead of just buying something that would t take the ports off of this, theirs was you actually had to buy hardware that plugged on and plugged on. It was all very expensive. Ours was going to be super cheap. If you just wanted to not add a hard drive to it, but just have the floppy interfaces and that kind of thing, basically make it just like an A500 without a hard drive. It was effectively a passive backplane that just snapped onto it. Really straightforward, real easy. Um, and here's the full motion video card. I could take this all apart. It's kind of a pain in the butt to do, but here it is. <laughs> and uh, you can see Lattice, that's our controller. C-Cube, that's our video. LSI, that's our audio. This is the ROM for, the, okay, you know what? Here, I'll just do this. Okay, so here's our Zorro bus interface. Same color coding as was on that previous slide. It's got a bunch of standard 74 series buffers and, and uh, registers that, that connect the Zorro bus into the control logic. The control logic then is able to talk to the video decode and the audio decode to take the code from the ROM that's stored program to drive the video decoder with its own clock source. Same thing for the audio decoder. Uh, here's its ROM, feed it into there. It's got its own clock source. These are going to be converting all that data stream stuff into actual frames of video that come out here and the full 16-bit per channel, 44.1 kilohertz audio coming out of here. It hits an audio DAC, stereo left-right audio DAC and some filtering and by the time it gets to the output signals on that AV bus, it's clean audio, sounded like it just came from a CD player. And then here it's got a big Signetics triple DAC and some analog filtering, and out it goes to the video connector there, and by the time it comes out, it's given you full frames of six, of um, whatever the uh, S, uh, VCD format video is. Everything's fine, it's all good. Um, the only other thing I didn't mention in the Zorro bus is the power. It's a voltage regulator with a big cap and a, a little LC filter on it. So it's power, bus interface, controlling the whole thing, video decode, audio decode, the digital side of things, converting them to analog and, and bringing them out. So, yes, the design could have been put into this form factor and then plugged into a 4000. But really, this is exactly the same design that I did for the CD4000. Somebody else picked it up. I'm really bad with names. Dan. F, Dan, I could look it up. I've, I've been looking for it for a while. I, I, I haven't found it yet. But Dan, Dan was the guy that, that took my MPEG 4000 design, and it was on this great big 4000 card with lots of empty space on it, and he crushed it down into this little thing. Um, all right. That brings us to the CD1200. Remember, this is that product that was under development in early 1994. By early 1994, the writing was on the wall. There was a lot of people knew that there was something huge coming down. What we didn't know for sure was whether it was Commodore was about to get sold to Samsung or Sony or any of the other companies that were looking at us, or if it was the end. If Commodore was going to get sold, we needed to have something to sell them. And so Haney was working on the, the AAA machines, the really high-end stuff. I was working on this. It, what it was is you know one of the little L-shaped cards that plugs into the bottom of your 1200. It had on it the Akiko chip. Really not a good choice for that. What you really wanted to do was leave Gale and Budgie alone because they're already there. So why did you need the, the grace and beauty parts of the Akiko chip? You didn't. It had the chunky to planer. Good addition. It had all the CD drive stuff on it. Good addition. Um, but because it thought it was on the motherboard of a CD32, <clears throat> and you were plugging it in on the end of a Zorro chassis, a Zorro connector effectively, on your, on your output of your, your 1200, 
it didn't really like to live there. So we had a controller um, FPGA that I had to build that's job was to condition the Akiko to make it think that it was on the motherboard of a CD32. Um, there was a cable that came out of the back corner. It routed through from that little um, L-shaped card. Oh, sorry, the other things that were on that card besides the Akiko were you were um, basically using up the only expansion slot. Memory was a very po uh, popular expansion, so we put a RAM DIMM in there. You could load in, I think, 256 megs were the kind of standard of the day, so you could add a 256 meg DIMM to your, to your, 30, uh, to your uh, A1200 by slapping it into that socket on that card. Uh, what else did it have? Um, we had intentions, should somebody have bought the company, to say, all right, let's do this right. And instead of having an Akiko taking up a lot of room and this extra FPGA taking up a lot of room that just convinced the Akiko it was on something other than the, that it was on the CD32 motherboard even though it wasn't, redesign a custom chip to go there that would have taken the parts of Akiko that it needed, left off the parts that it didn't, interfaced to the Zorro bus directly, and you would have ended up with one chip instead of two. Well, what would you do with that extra space? Oh, I don't know, maybe a 68030 socket. That's where my brain was going with this. So you came out of the cable in the back, and you went out to a little unit that looked a lot like that. <laughs> it looked like a CD32, but just this half of it. There was a little stripe over here with a, with a reset button on it, and a drawer just like a CD32. Um, the, uh, the back of it had all the same stuff and you were going to have to take your audio out of your 1200 and into this and then there was a mixer inside of this that would then go off to your, to your speakers or whatever you had. Similarly with the video, the video we were able to get it to go through the cable so I don't think we needed a video in but we still had the video out and now it would come from the external box. We built nine prototypes of these things. No, okay, we, we took the video through the, the data in and brought it back. Um, you know, we built nine prototypes of these things. Uh, where they ended up in the world, I wish I knew. I wish I could get a hold of one, but they're, they're long since dispersed, I'm sure. Uh, here's your, your L-shaped card for your, your 1200. I'm sorry? Don't you speak to me about I've got one, don't I? Question, Let me put this in no, the intention was it plugged into your A1200. Okay, so here's you think plugged into the bottom of an A1200 is your L-shaped card with a ribbon cable coming out, and then there was a converter to a big fat round cable. The round cable came across and plugged in here. You can see it. That's the, that's yeah, that's that's it right there going around. It sat next to your 1200. Maybe you had a little room for your mouse, whatever, and. It looked, you know, a lot like what a CD32 looked like, just without all this extra electronics to be the rest of the Amiga. All it was going to be was this Akiko here. This is where the RAM card is. This is the ROM that uh, held the, the drivers effectively for this thing. Another part of it that we could have optimized better when we went to the next generation. Out through the cable to connect to your data in, and again, you had your audio in to audio out to do your mixing for your audio power. Pretty straightforward. Um, the intention was to, uh, to allow you to take a CD32 disc and drop it into something that would play just fine on your 1200. And because it included the, the Akiko's chunky to planar converter and everything else that Akiko needed to do, um, it really was completely compatible with a CD32. But we found out in April of, of 1994 exactly what that big thing coming was, and it was the end. So <laughs> there was no buyer. Nobody ended up taking these to market. The nine prototype units went wherever prototype units go when these sort of things happen, and that was, that was the end of that. So that's pretty much where the evolution started with getting involved with the MPEG committees that Jeff Porter was doing pre-1992, the proof of concept products, the, the future thoughts for how to expand things, the where we could go if we had more time, 
Oh, yeah, the one thing I forgot to mention was that the, the, the MPEG, uh, the video, the full motion video aspect of this was that underneath the card here was another one of these kind of connectors. <laughs> and if you had a CL480 that could do audio and video and synchronize them, had the ROM, only one, just didn't all that stuff together in one small package, you could have put together a full gen lockable vi uh, MPEG stream and stuck it on the bottom of the card on the inside of this box. So that was going to be the other part of our second generation, was to add the 68030 socket and to give it full motion video capability. So that's, that's the future directions for this product that, that never was. Okay, so that's, that's where we were. Any questions? There you go. So Trevor was just saying that he had, I would say the word hacked, <laughs> a CD32 to use as a CD-ROM drive on a 1200. Right. You pretty much, yeah. There's there, there's a lot of commonality between the design of the CD32 and the CD and the CD1200. As again, you know, you add a passive backplane to it, and suddenly now you've got your keyboard port, your mouse port, your floppy port, your other, um, your serial port, your parallel port. Your, your graphics port, it was all there. You just needed to make a passive black thing. And also, there was a, a thing called Hot Dive or Mill, um, when Nick Tinker uh, has that information in the UK, the whole uh, information system, you know, the information system for the London Passport Museum based on networks. Really? It's amazing. Okay, so what Trevor was just saying there for the folks on the net was that uh, the, the Metropolitan Transport Museum in London was uh, put together using, they're, they're, they had a display put together using network CD32s to, to do their, 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 their kiosk system. Yeah. yeah. Lovely. Brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions, comments? So, you know, thanks for joining me on the trip to the Wayback Machine here. And uh, appreciate, appreciate the interest in the history. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>